Hi guys, welcome back. I am Red Zed, and today we once again have another very special ranking video with Ahal. Welcome back to the channel, Ahal. Good to be here, man. It's uh, I don't think I'm a special guest anymore. <laughs> yeah a regular you're, you're, you're like a regular slot now so uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah today we do have a very special one because we've ranked the thracians we've ranked the illyrians um as well and we've ranked the anatolians too so check those out in the description but today we're ranking the big boys the diadochi and the Hellenistic factions. The Greek one is going to be coming soon as well. So uh, when that does come, we will put an announcement out so you get to see that live. So that'll be amazing. But we're ranking these guys today. And as always, we're ranking them based on their strength. Most likely their strength as the most important thing at the start and throughout the game. Um, how much they were historically, whether they were important, etc. And, you know, how cool they are as well. And you get to see our rankings at the end that do have some controversial picks. So uh, that's going to be interesting. But um, should we get straight on with the uh, the Lysachads or the Lysiads, shall we say? Um, oh, and, sure. and I'll let Why you, not? I'll let you uh, take this one first because I know you do really like these guys and know quite a bit about them. So um, take it away. Um, well, I only know things about them because, of um, and other than that, I don't think anybody is going to be able to find anything, including you, uh, when you did them for your video, you weren't able to find out any information on them. I mean, objectively speaking, this is definitely the D tier, um, cursed, yeah. uh, Hellenistic yeah. faction, but, um, so the, uh, Lysias was descended from another Lysias and a Philomelon. <laughs> um, they are basically Macedonians who had either settled or had been placed by Alexander, you know, yeah. a Diadochi yeah. leader in Phrygia and specifically in the towns or city of Sinata, which is a Phrygian city right in the heart of uh, Anatolia. And there was a Macedonian colony called Dokomaeon, which was within, they call it the Chora or um, countryside of the Sinata city-state. So they had own ownership of both. And Dokomaeon was known for like marble and stuff. And But anyways, um, sometime in the Seleucid history... It just, Lysias himself seems to have appeared a lot and seemed to be doing a lot of independent actions. Now, whether he was within the Seleucid Empire acting with autonomy or if he had quietly, you know, broke away from the Seleucid Empire, we don't know because the Seleucid Empire in this region was going through a bunch of different changes. So... Um, there had been a great revolt, uh, a succession revolt in Anatolia around the same time. Did he kind of revolt with that? Did he just kind of stay loyal? Um, whatever. Doesn't matter. He did what he wanted to do. He was involved with Pergamon. He was involved with Rhodes. And so we decided to represent him and his dynasty as kind of like a what-if Hellenistic dynasty. Um, but only kind of what if, because he did exist, and it was a dynasty. Uh, we just don't know how independent they were. So it's a very intriguing faction. Uh, but as far as gameplay is concerned, um, they are the most cursed. They only get two settlements, <laughs> and you are surrounded by the Seleucids. And if you've managed to get past them, you have the Galatians to your north, and the Ptolemies to your south, uh, as well as Selge and the Anatolian CG. So yeah, it's... Uh, not an easy start. I definitely think it should be a challenge video. They do get the Seleucid <laughs> roster minus Seleucid elite units. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it, but they also get like some Greek actual like basic Greek units, and they also get the Phrygian, our wonderful OP Phrygian units. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're a very interesting faction, and um, you know Mausolos. Did a lot to push for them, um, justified them. Um, I've become a fan of them. 
and it would be cool to see you do a campaign as them. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> I don't really have anything to add to that. They're a solid D because they are, that is a, they're out of all these factions, like probably out of a lot of the other factions that we've ranked as well, probably one of the worst, worst spawns that you can, you can get in. It's basically by Thinia, but without a decent army. So um, at the start anyway. So yeah, definitely D tier. Um, so let's move on to the uh, the Bactrians then, guys. And if you are enjoying this series, guys, this series of videos, a like and a subscribe would be massively appreciated. And remember, you can do this ranking too and put them in the Developer Diaries Discord. That would be amazing. We want to see all your rankings and see how different they are from or from ours. But um, Bactria. Now, I love Bactria, personally. I love the history of the place. Um, I love the story behind it. I love the fact that they survived for a long, long time um, as a culture in the region. And yes, but I also think gameplay-wise that they are, in fact, a fantastic faction. Um, at the minute, you know, you do have the Parthians and the Sarka Rauka. Oh, sorry, the Sarka near nearby and the Morians um as well but the morians have to come through a very tight mountain pass which should be easy to defend or fort wall if you so wish and the bactrians like they are probably the most profitable nation in, at the start or can be the most profitable nation in about 20 turns or so if you manage them right so um i think solid a tier and when i say most profitable guys i don't mean they're making the most money i'm meaning their balance sheet is the most green <laughs> so uh <laughs> like they have the biggest difference between their losses and their profits if you uh, manage them well early game like they are so rich they've got so many mines in the region that you can make them an absolute powerhouse so i'm gonna say and they also have cool units they have the battery and thorakitai which are really cool so i'm gonna say solid a tier for me but what do you think you know what um that's a Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, they're an incomplete faction. Yeah. Uh, because there's a lot of native units in the area that we haven't made. But that doesn't, I don't think, I mean, their core faction roster is complete. Uh, hmm. Yeah, A tier seems like it makes a lot of sense. I have to agree. They just, they have a lot of money and, um, for the way the mod is right now, the Parni and the Sokka and the Marians. I mean, the Marians have a lot of land, but they're not super aggressive. And then Parni and Sokka don't do much because we haven't worked on them yet. And so because of that, you really only have to worry about the Seleucids. Um, and their their core territories are so far away. So yeah, I'd say A tier. Yeah, I just think like they're so rich compared to a lot of the factions on this list like that you can kind of just do what you want with them. Like you could even just not even take any land and just play tall if you if you are interested in that. <laughs> Although most people don't play Total War to play tall, but uh, you could do that if you want to. Um, so on to the uh, Bosporans then, another incomplete faction, but what do you reckon for them? Um, The Bosporans, I love the Bosporans. Same. Um, again, a very incomplete faction majorly incomplete i mean they only got two units made as well as a couple of generic greeks um um i would say probably b to be to be honest with you what just because they're um, incomplete yeah it's just they're incomplete no not because they're incomplete well they have chersonesos as a as a there's like their main enemy at the beginning as well as the Sarasis. Maybe just because okay, for the way it is A tier because it doesn't seem like it's that hard. I feel like it would be a pretty easy campaign to be honest. You have a lot of rebel settlements and you have two initial rivals in the vicinity but neither of those rivals are like necessarily strong. Yeah. You do have a decent roster. You get the Bosporan Hoplites. You get a Bosporan Makai or a Fora unit, which is really powerful. And, um, yeah. 
I think okay, A tier. Yeah. What I about mean, you? I, yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm happy to put them in B tier, um, just because of the fact that they're so incomplete in terms of the roster. But uh, yeah, it's just it's such an easy campaign, and you get horse archers like. <laughs> so what what else can you do without like <laughs> than than put them in A tier if they have horse archers really? So <laughs> Greek units with with horse archer auxiliaries to help them out. Like, there's not much stronger combination in the region than that, is there, really? So, uh, yeah, I think they've got to be A tier, really. They, I mean, I'm happy to put them B, but I think, yeah, they're, they're so strong. They're so easy to do. They're, they're you know, they're not exactly a, a difficult faction. If you're looking for a nice, easy faction to play that doesn't start too big or too small, they're the perfect faction for you and doesn't have too many enemies around them as well. So, yeah, I, I would say solid AT. I'm going to put them below Bactria, though, just because Bactria is more complete and uh, has a bit more flavor to it at the moment, I would say. So, yeah. Uh, but on to um, Kyrene, then. And um, Kyrene, oh. interesting, very interesting faction. I mean, you're basically the the break off from the Ptolemies. You're uh, Ptolemy's brother, right? I believe as Kyrene. Um, so yes, as Kyrene, you are Ptolemy's brother. So you think you have a claim to the Ptolemaic Empire, and you're sort of the rebellious break off region. The guy who was the Kyrene leader at the time. I can't remember exactly his name. Is it Karaunos? Uh, Magas. Magas. Okay. So, yeah, he he um, obviously was the governor of that region for quite some time and built an, up, up enough support for the region to support him in rebelling against Ptolemy. Um, and, yeah, you just kind of start in a, in a desert with not much land, um, not much riches, and with a pretty large and sizable scary, um, scary neighbor. So, although it's an incredibly interesting start, it's quite a difficult one as well. Uh, in terms of your roster, probably not quite as expansive as the Ptolemies as well, but not not terribly bad either. Pretty decent roster that you get access to. But yeah, it, it's basically the campaign is you fighting the Ptolemies. And when that's done, you become the Ptolemies. So you're kind of doing a Ptolemaic campaign, but from a smaller start. So um, I do think it's really cool, but at the same time, pretty darn difficult. So... I would say probably C tier, but it's kind of on the border, I would say, between C and B. I see it from a different angle. Um, it's not a desert faction by any means. I mean, a few of them, sure, but it's a coastal Greek faction. Um, and it has one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Five, it's the they were known for having a pentapolis hmm. um, and uh there's five at least large towns in uh Kyrene right now and the capital is a minor city yeah so you have a really good economy to start i mean in every single one of them except for four have a port which i feel like all five need to have a port and that's probably an oversight but um, they all have ports, so trade is prevalent. Um, they do have some fringe towns like Antiperigos, Tetrapergia, and um, Peritonion are towns. And then you have uh, Atamala on the other side, closer to Carthage as a town. Those are basically, historically, they were like fortresses and, and just towns. They weren't anything special. So your core is kind of protected. Your core is not exposed. You do have your main army in Peritonion. Um, because of the whole situation with the Ptolemies, but that doesn't mean that that has to be your move. Um, if you really, um, you could chance it. I mean, who? we don't know how aggressive the Ptolemies could be, and it wouldn't be too hard to ship them back if it was an issue, but um, I would take Crete. I would take advantage of Crete. Um, you got a big enough army, and it's Hellenistic with pikes. Yeah. You should be able to go take Crete. And if the Ptolemies attack one of your... Um, you have three border towns, basically, that the Ptolemies have to kind of go through before they get to your... kind of your economic area. So you you can even strategically sacrifice those towns knowing that you'll be back 
to push back the Ptolemies. I mean, think about this. You attack Crete, and while you're taking out all those factions, Ptolemies take their three the three settlements on the way to your homeland. You then take your troops and you go boat bomb Alexandria, splitting the Ptolemaics in two. Kind of like how you did with the Rhodian campaign. Yeah. I still think there's a way to defeat the Ptolemies without being a copy paste Ptolemaic campaign. Um you also, if you want to, you could go for Carthage. Historically, um, Kyrene tried attacking Carthage um, at, before, uh, back when Syracuse had uh, Dionysius as its king. So mm. I think there's more options. I don't think it's as hard. Um, I would say it's a B tier, but not as easy as a Bosporan. But with that being said, I do understand your arguments. I think they're good arguments, and I'm okay if you think they're better off in C tier. Now, I think I think I can, I agree with B. Like, like you say, you can do some interesting things with them, um, but you could do that with any faction as well. That's that's the thing. You could just get your army on a boat and sail to wherever you wanted if if you really want to do that. But I do think that going for Crete is a good tactic. But the main like thrust of the campaign is going to be fighting the the Ptolemies, and um, I know Crete has a uh, sorry not Crete, Kyrene has a few uh, <laughs> a few decent settlements, but the Ptolemies have what like hundred and fifty settlements at the start or something like that. Like, they have a lot, <laughs> so they are going to be a tough enemy. But I can see an argument for B, so I think we'll put it in B because. I think we'll leave space for C for uh, something else. <laughs> so let's go B. And uh, yeah, I, I do think Kyrene, like, as I said, is really interesting as a faction and a start. So that's probably tipping it in its favor as well. But um, onto uh, Pergamon then. And seen by many as a very difficult, like, major faction start. So what do you reckon to uh, Pergamon? Pergamon. I think is either a C or D just because of its start. Um, you start allied with the Seleucids, but depending on what difficulty you're playing on, we don't know how long that's going to last for, yeah. but oh. you, you have, you do have some easy snipes at the beginning of the game. If you're okay with, um, you know, having a little bit of a disjointed kingdom, um, the first easy snipe would be Chios which the AI actually likes to go for Chios. The second yeah. easy snipe would be Priene. And a, another easy snipe um, would be Kizikos. So you have three snipes within the general vicinity that you could go for. There's also a few other things that you could go for um, to kind of give you some income. And that's the three Athenian islands of Imbros, oh, yeah. uh, Lemnos, and Skyros. So you have kind of an, you could have an island hopping campaign. And here's the other thing. The Seleucids uh, keep you away from bordering the Ptolemies on land. So you could take all the Ptolemaic islands and like, uh, I guess, jut, land, jut out land that they have. So like they have a territory in Thrace. They have one. They have, an, they have Samo Thrace as an island. They have two islands in Mytilene. The, with Mytilene and Methymna. Um, and then they have the peninsula, the Ionian peninsula with Erythrae next to Chios. Hmm. So you can kind of pick apart. There's also an Athos of the GCS. So you can kind of pick apart your neighbors that aren't very strong around you. The Ptolemies are not very strong in this region. Yeah. Um, and then maybe by then the Seleucids attack. Uh, maybe by then... Maybe they attack before. I don't know, but I think that would be the strategy. However, because of the mid and late game is basically you slogging it out with the Seleucids <laughs> and then the Ptolemies, most likely. Um, I would say this is probably a C tier. Yeah. Um, but I could see it being a D tier as well. I think uh, I think solid C because, like you say, there are a lot of small enemies like Chios, Chios. Uh, um Kizikus, like all those little factions that you can just go take out get little islands go on islands 
Um, fight the Ptolemies, whatever you want to do. Maybe go to Crete as well, like we said. Peloponnese, potentially. Um, do some raiding there. You know, it's... Um, and it is an interesting campaign because you do start not that strong. But, like I say, it's one of those campaigns that, that happens a lot in this region and did happen historically, not in terms of campaigns, but historically in terms of the fates of these nations. It all depends on what the, the Seleucids decide to do. And... <laughs> They might decide that on the second turn, you're not a valuable ally anymore and send one of their full stacks. So it is really very much dependent on what the Seleucids want to do with you. And uh, that is the case for a lot of these little factions around there. But So again, qu can be quite difficult, but you can escape if you really want to. Like uh, I did as Priene in the, the Priene challenge video, which you can check out in the description, guys. Um where we basically were just like, well, Priene is going to get attacked and taken, so we are just going to all the islands <laughs> and escaping their wrath on our boats. Um, so, yeah, um, I definitely think interesting, very interesting campaign, but uh, as an objectively as a campaign, very not that easy compared to some of the others that we have in the list. So, shall we move on to the uh, the big boys then, the, uh, the Antigonids? Mm -hmm. And, All right. I mean, like, if they're not in S, then this is going to get, like, this This video is going to get banned from YouTube. <laughs> like, I, I think they're in the low of S, though. They, they're, like, the low S or maybe a mm. high A because as, like, if you're playing the Antigonids on medium... You can just have your jolly time and do whatever you want to do. Attack whoever you want to attack. And you're not going to get attacked much because you're the strongest player in the region by quite some time. Uh, quite some time. quite By a, quite a margin. Um, you are like really strong compared to a lot of the rivals. But if you're playing on very hard or hard, and especially extreme mode, it's kind of like a campaign of, of dying by a thousand cuts. Well surviving a thousand cuts shall i say because all of these little factions you pretty much bo like border them all they're all going to attack you and it's just going to be a little bit annoying <laughs> they're never going to attack you with something that you're so scared like you're scared of that you can't beat but you're going to have to spend time bouncing around between nations a lot and just taking out one small nation after the other not that that's that difficult but overall fantastic roster Great starting position, although slightly cut in the middle. That can be rectified almost immediately in the campaign if you want it to be. Um, and you probably are going to fight quite a diverse range of enemies, from Thracians to Illyrians to the Greeks. So, yeah, I mean, I think I, I've, I've, I've argued myself into being low S tier, but what do you think? I will make one argument for A tier with the with being okay if it's s tier i mean yeah so at the start of this campaign the antigonids were not in the best shape they weren't in terrible shape mm -hmm. as we know by their political situation with the map but they weren't in the best shape militarily they had no troops of their own except for the vanguard that was with antigonos himself so other than a couple mercenary garrisons down in Greece, like in Demetrius, Chalcis, and Corinth, and the Piraeus, uh, they had no army. Um, they probably had a weak mercenary garrison in each of its settlements, or they relied on the local militias and state troops to do mm. their thing. Their army starts uh, with mercenary phalangites, coplites, peltas, and like a conglomerate. Now, historically, they had some Celts, they don't have Celts right now because we haven't remastered the Celts. But once the Celts do get remastered, the Antigonid starting position will change a little bit with a few Celtic units. They also had some Thracian units and some Illyrian. So basically, um, Antigonus didn't have a national state army. And in fact, the Antigonid manpower was depleted completely yeah. from all the Diadopi wars, all the secession wars in Macedon, Alexander settling people all over the world. Mm -hmm. So their manpower was really low. 
I would say they're a high A tier because of all these situations, but they become S tier if managed properly and given time to grow. Because as we know in history, they became Philip the Fifth Macedon, where they yeah. challenged Rome twice, and the Perseus Macedon, where he was able to levy um, thousands of troops. So it's a very fruitful and fertile region that can have huge population growth. It's just they start off with such low population um, and no military. So I'm okay with low A tier. I mean, uh, low S tier, but I can also see them being the highest A tier. It's it, Yeah. It, 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 I mean, you, like what, what you're talk, talking about historically as well, like they literally have just, like Antigonus Gennatus has just come out of hiding like two or three years before they were he's hiding with his army in like a backwater to basically uh because pyrrhus owned Ep uh, owned macedon at the time like pyrrhus marched into macedon beat him and took control of macedon and we know what happened to pyrrhus and it's literally only been a couple of years uh, at the start of the mod since antigonus Gennatus even owned like most of macedon so i kind of uh, yeah I, I like the argument however i think gameplay wise in the hands of the player like you're just still so strong <laughs> yeah. that i i feel like they have to be an s tier and that's that's not even because of the history of them and stuff which is really cool and all of them alexander stuff um <coughs> alexander uh but uh, <laughs> yeah, i i think in terms of in the hands of the player they are low s tier because compared to some of the other nations that might be s tier they aren't as powerful but they still are the hegemon like they are the hegemonic power in that region and if you play with them you can just absolutely just steamroll everyone if you really want to so uh, yeah i don't know are you happy we'll we'll let you next time there's a split decision you can you can put the solutions in d tier <laughs> no, no i'm i have no problem with a or s yeah fair enough um right on to Epirus then, and I've just played a campaign as them, so <laughs> um, I can talk about them a little bit. I think Epirus is a very interesting one. Of course, awesome history, really cool. I love Epirus uh, in terms of its history. But in terms of gameplay, I, if you look at this list, this list is studded with heavyweights, like absolute heavyweights in terms of gameplay. We've got the Bosporans who start off in an easy position with horse archers. You have the Bactrians who start off in a position where they're making an absolute fortune and can make much more money if you manage their cities well. We have the Antigonids who are the power in the region. You actually start at war with them. So they're studded with some absolute heavy hitters and it's about to be studded with some even bigger heavy hitters. So when I look at this list, Epirus in terms of a campaign, in terms of a faction, especially when you consider that early game you're going to be relying on Deuteroy, which are one of the worst phalangites in the game. And I say with that, they say that with experiential venom because I hate those bastards. I hate them. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you do get like really cool units later on. You get the Molossians, you get the... Um, uh, Molossian Agima, the Molossian Cavalry as well. Uh, Molossian Hesiroi, sorry, should I say. Um, the Ambrachio Phalangites are great too. Um, you don't get a Thorakitai though, do you? Do you get a Thorakitai? I can't remember. I don't think you do. I think it's just Thoriophoroi. Um, so yeah, um, and your start position now is probably even more difficult. You start at war with Macedon and... In the north, you're going to have the Illyrians and the Illyrian kingdom to contend with now. So, yeah, I think then they're kind of mid. They're, they're like the difficulty. They're not the Lysiads. They're not Pergamon, but they're probably slightly harder than Kyrene. Would you agree with that? Mm, yeah. B tier. Um. I would say below Kyrene, yeah. It's weird because Epirus is way more popular than Kyrene, so it's weird. Um, but as far as difficulty is concerned, absolutely not. And here's the thing is you are you were were missing an element from your campaign now is you didn't have the Illyrians yeah. to your north and 
we don't know how that's going to go. I mean, he started at war with the Illyrian kingdom now. Mm. Um, and whereas you pretty much just have free access to rebel settlements up there. Uh, well, the Antigonids did and any other Antigonids. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, and, and another thing to note with them as well is the land that they start with is, I don't know what... I, I don't know what it, it is, it, but it's absolutely like, awful. <laughs> the Illyrians in fertility, yeah. Um, no, yeah, I think I think that's good. Uh, their their roster is interesting. They have the Epiro Phalangites now, yeah, and Ambraciots or Ambracia only. So there has been some changes since you played them. Um, Deuteroy and all of that stuff. Uh, the phalanx has just gotten a slight, some slight tweaks to help with their formations. I don't know if it's actually made a helpful difference or not, though. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, just politically speaking and where you start, you do gain, to be fair, you do gain uh, a Tintinopolis, which is just a town, and Casope, which is a town. Mm. But still, it's still two more towns with two more sets of income. Um, and then you do have an easy rebel settlement to take to your south now. So there's definitely been some adjustments. I don't know if any of those adjustments justify it being easier than Kyrene, though. I no. mean, you got to face the Antigonids, and then you have the a little annoying factions to your south... Um, Rome could boat bomb you like we saw. Sparta could boat bomb you. <laughs> yeah. uh, Acarnanians will attack you. Acarnanians. Like. Now, like I said, with the Illyrian kingdom to your north. Yeah, man. I think we're good. I think it's below Kyrie yeah. in, in E tier. And remember, guys, we're not just grading these on difficulty, but when we look at Kyrene and we look at Epirus, they both have very similar rosters. Um, very similar and they both start at war with a major power so they're very similar so the only thing we can really discern the difference between them is difficulty wise like um and i think epirus although it's i would say it's it's on the mid tier of difficulty like it's not the lice it's not cursed it, it is definitely um you know middle tier difficulty it's not like the bactrians who have all the time in the world to do whatever they want uh, or even the antigonids that might be quite difficult if you're not experienced but if you are experienced you can just you know absolutely power over people so um yeah on to um one of your favorite factions <laughs> i'm joking <laughs> yeah. the ptolemies so what uh, do you think about the ptolemies um uh s tier for sure and the only evidence I really have is based on the your campaign with Rain as Rhodes. And it seems it seems like they have a hyper obsession with micro Faroe cavalry. Hmm. Um, but you know what? Like I know that we're gonna get to balancing a lot, lot of stuff this current dev cycle. So I'm not too worried about that. But just as far as like their position. I feel like they have a stronger position than the Seleucids because they're not as spread out as the Seleucids. Yeah. So public order isn't as hard. You do have to deal with the Egyptian revolt. Um, but I feel like if managed properly, that's just made mainly just like a, an annoyance mm. more than a, an actual issue. Um, in Anatolia, you're probably your weakest because you only have one army. And you have a lot of nations to contend with. But again, proper management, you should be okay. Um, and honestly, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, you're going to be at war with the Seleucids mainly. Yeah. And you have a great uh, roster. So You do have one of the best rosters in the game. Probably the best roster of no, the Hellenistic. No, 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 no. <laughs> the Seleucids well, have the best okay. roster. <laughs> well, you don't, okay. <laughs> you don't have cataphract. You get ca I'm joking, I'm joking. cataphract. You don't get armored elephants. You get like the little towered African elephants, and you don't get scythe <laughs> chariots. You do get Therakotai, though. You do get pretty much the same level of phalanx mm. units, um, and you have a much more diverse roster. Um, to be fair, though, the Egyptians are a fully 
remastered faction. They are fully completed, mm -hmm. um, except for maybe some AOR in Syria and Judea. But yeah, as far as like Egypt is concerned, um, not only are the Ptolemaic units done, the Egyptian units are done. So <clears throat> you have a little bit more of a clear picture of to what the Ptolemies' full potential is. So, yeah, I mean, I guess they're one of the more complete fac faction unit rosters that we have. So, I don't know. Yeah, I'd say S tier above the Antigonids. Yeah, um, I'm just joking about that. I, <laughs> I'm just stay. I'm just uh, standing up to my boy for for my boy the the Cellu Chads. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, Ptolemies. I personally, I agree with everything you've said there. I personally think that pre the emergent factions, this was the strongest faction in the game. Um, and I think they are easier, a lot easier to manage than the Seleucids because you have less cultures to worry about. You have more friendly cultures or sort of, like, sort of Greek cultures uh, in your land. I know you've got the Egyptians in a lot of the land too, but um, all of those cities should be fine for quite a while. You also get the amazingly fertile and like farming rich region of the Nile and Nile Delta, which your cities are going to grow there incredibly fast, which is absolutely fantastic for you because there's so many cities in that little region. And if you make them all, make like five or six cities recruitment hubs like we did in the roads campaign as roads like you can just pump out troops like constantly over there um and although your anatolian holdings are a little bit more unstable and a little bit weaker and you've got sort of a thin line there i don't think you're going to have much of a problem if you're playing as them beating those Seleucid armies. And once those Seleucid armies are dead, you've got free range to just go through Sardis and start taking out the Seleucids there um, pretty nicely. So, yeah, I think Ptolemy's incredibly strong nation. Just, you know, you need to know how to manage it. And I'm actually going to use this argument now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this argument as segue into the Seleucids with it, if that's okay with you. Okay. So this is an argument about the Seleucids versus the Ptolemies. So I think the Ptolemies okay. is easier, right? The Ptolemies is easier because you don't need to manage as much. But I think the Ptolemies are weaker, and I'll tell you why. Firstly, the Seleucids have more settlements. So if you know how to manage them well, you're going to have more success. You're going to have more money overall. Secondly, now this is an interesting argument, and let's see whether you agree with it or not. With the emergent factions, a lot of them actually spawn out of the Ptolemies. So you got Lycia, Chrysaurians, Silesians, Egyptians. And how many spawn out of the Seleucids? Just the Lysiads, pretty much. Maybe um, Militos, uh, not Militos, uh, maybe uh, Militos, yeah. Um, and those are like tiny factions. So, like, that can actually, you know, hamper you a little bit more as the Ptolemies. Um, on top of that, you start with two full stacks in Anatolia as opposed to the Ptolemies' one. Um, and as the Seleucids, your roster, in my opinion, is better. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I think because you get cataphracts, you get war elephants. Um, I know you get a fantastic like royal like swordsman unit for the Ptolemies, right? So I can't really argue that the Agira Spizes reform swordsmen are, are any better than that. But I think just the, the Seleucid roster is better. Now, but I will say they are harder because it's a lot harder to manage that many settlements, especially the ones in the east that are sort of Iranian cultures. Um, you've got Median cultures, that sort of thing. So I do think harder to manage, but in my opinion, stronger as a faction um, as well. So I would put them at the top. But then again, I am like, I can't stress how biased I, biased I am. So, yeah, let's see. I mean, what do you think? <laughs> going to be hard-pressed. I do think the Ptolemies are easier than the Seleucids. Um, they're just easier. Yeah. That's all I can say. I mean, Seleucids appear stronger. They're more of a paper tiger in that regard. They were more of a paper tiger historically. Uh, so the Ptolemies lasted longer. Uh, the Seleucids did have Antiochus the, the Great. So there's that. Um, 
there is a here's another thing is they're not complete uh everything east of anatolia is not really been focused on so if you think about it there may be a third complete uh yeah. we still have to figure yeah. out syria and mesopotamia and then we have to figure out persia and their far east territories um and we haven't worked on those like we haven't put all the characters there we haven't done all the cultures uh, we haven't done all the aor units that they could get so they are not finished and so because of that i will put the ptolemies above the salute oh that hurts me that hurts my soul <laughs> I, know, I know it hurts you man but it's just objective it's just the objective situation right now i still think they're stronger but okay because of the Indo-Greeks and like everything in the East. Yeah, that is, that is another good point though as well. Because as the Ptolemies, you're going to be facing Kyrene, which is remastered. You're going to be facing the Seleucids, which are, you know, roster-wise pretty much remastered. You're going to be facing in Anatolia, all the Anatolians the same as the Seleucids. So those are kind of the three main areas. You will fight Kush as well, so they're not remastered. But as the Seleucids, in the east, you're going to be fighting, like, Moria, which is not remastered. Bactria, which is remastered, like, mostly. Um, but big wars are going to happen with, like, Parthia and Moria, Armenia, Atropatine. So you're going to have a lot of the time actually fighting non-remastered factions. And I think when they are remastered, the Seleucids, they got to go top. But because the campaign, you're not going to be fighting as many of the factions that are done... Uh, and uh, right in the campaign, you know, it's uh, it's maybe you know, b b some down <laughs> tears streaming down my face right now. <laughs> so uh, then we've got the Hellenistic rebels, which um, I'm assuming we're going to put in B, like we have with all the uh, cultural uh, generics. But uh, do you want to talk a little bit about these boys? Yeah, so they're a little bit different than the others. They don't really start with they don't start with any territories, except for their little island settlement to keep mm. them alive. Um, but they do they can revolt if the city has been designated as Hellenistic yeah. by us. So even though it may be like like all the Alexandrias in the Seleucid Empire are considered Hellenistic or the Antiochs yeah. or whatever, all the Hellenistic named cities were foundations colonies. And they had a significant population um, that was Greek and Macedonian. And um, it was a blend of culture. So we wanted this faction to represent those states or cities that would possibly break away um, upon like faction leader dying um, or something like there's there's examples of um, satraps and governors and, uh, you know, city state republics just kind of like breaking off and doing their own thing the Lysiads are kind of like one of them the Lysiads are kind of like the example of here's a faction representing that the hellenistic rebels kind of represent everybody else that could potentially do that so yeah. andragoras was the the he's like the most popular one brought up he you know there's there's some academic debate but andragoras broke away supposedly from the Seleucids about the same time that Bactria broke away and he took of all of he took all of Hyrcania and Parthia. Mm. So Hyrcania being the fertile lands south of the Caspian and then Parthia being the desert uh, lands uh, just uh, east of it. Uh, but what that did is it opened the door for the Parni to come down and kill him and take him his lands over uh, thus becoming the Parthia that we know in history. Yeah. So um, did he actually break away? We don't know. Was he just a governor? We don't know. We were going to, we had plans to simulating him, but due to engine limitations and everything, it just wasn't working without causing issues and like crashes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I opted to go for a little bit more of a generic overarching, um, feature where they could just revolt in cities Yeah. to represent those, those. And, um, uh, I hope to make some scenarios one day when we can of some playable scenarios, which will be interesting. And um, but until then, they serve its purpose. And I've seen them revolt in Epirus. Mm. I've seen them revolt in Macedon. They revolt a lot in Anatolia. I've seen them revolt in the Far East, just based on tests and stuff. So yeah. it's really interesting to see, and I'm glad we have them. In. 
Yeah, definitely. And like you have to remember, a lot of these empires, especially the Seleucids, like the Seleucids basically re- like replaced the Achaemenids, really, and um, the Persian Empire, and they ruled. They were probably the only the only faction out of the Diad Diadochi Diadochi that actually tried to do some sort of a you know cultural like expansive cultural integration like the ptolemies were crowned in in uh, memphis by the high priest but uh, for all intents and purposes the macedonians and the greeks were pretty bigoted really when it comes to other cultures like they did not integrate much with other cultures and believe themselves to be above all other cultures and the seleucids out of all of them were unique in the fact that they were more accepting of the Persians and the Eastern cultures. More accepting at that time, though, is not exactly accepting as we would as we would say today. But um, for example, Seleucos was the only of them not to discard his Persian wife when uh, Alexander died. All the rest of them just discarded their Persian wives instantly, whereas Seleucos actually remained um, married to them and allowed a lot of uh, Iranian and Mesopotamian cultures uh, to not operate freely. But in terms of like the governance as well, uh, well, sorry, I got distracted there, not operate freely, but, you know, keep their customs and that sort of thing. Um, But in terms of the governance, like all these satraps, like the Persians basically like got satraps and then were just like, yeah, we conquered you. This is like, you can manage it for us and just send us taxes. And if you don't send us taxes, we'll know something's wrong and we're going to come and conquer you again. So make sure you do send your taxes to us. Um, And the Seleucids is very similar because like, imagine trying to manage an empire that large at the time. Um, Like, how do you get messages places quickly? You know, how do you keep an area uh, under your rule when they haven't seen... Um, they haven't seen a, a Seleucid like army in in forty years, so like they were very independent. All of these regions, and I do like the Hellenistic rebels being there, ready to uh, spring out when you let some of your settlements have a bit too much independence, shall we say? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, really cool. But sorry, that was just a bit of a rambling about the Seleucids as usual, which I tend to go on every now and then. <laughs> um but if you do enjoy our rankings guys do like and subscribe at this point but uh well our collective ranking whoa what about our rankings yeah that's what i was gonna say if you like our collective ranking we're gonna now look at our ranking and are we going traditional and going with me first of course okay well here we go then boys here we go mine on top as usual and we'll start from the bottom the lysa chads just i i i i know you like the history and find it find it interesting i do find it relatively interesting um but just as a faction just doesn't really interest me starting with two little regions <laughs> in between the Seleucids and the galatians yep been there done that with paphlagonia and paphlagonia is cooler because they basically just were nothing <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm just not a big fan of the Lycians. That's, you that's all. technically nothing too. They get a better roster. Yeah, give a better shot. Give a better shot. I don't know. Challenge campaign accepted is what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we have Kyrene, which again just doesn't really interest me that much. I mean, I like your suggestion of going for Crete, uh, and I think that is a good suggestion. Definitely spice up the campaign a lot. But slogging it out with the Ptolemies for like. 100 200 turns is just not really something that interests me a huge amount i know that's kind of seems a bit ironic that i've got bactria so high but i think uh bactria i just love bactria hellenistic rebels are just in the middle pergamon's also in the middle just kind of meh i find them quite interesting as a faction but to play them not so much epirus has got to be an a because who doesn't love pyrrhus who doesn't love that uh that rogue of a man who thought that he could take on everyone and win and was killed by an old woman with a roof tile. Like, 
how how can there not be a more in like that, that, how can there be a more interesting story than that of a man at the time um conquering everything but holding on to nothing that i think that's the most the biggest irony of pyrrhus's life is the fact that he conquered everything he set out to conquer pretty much well apart from sparta in the end but uh <laughs> nearly everything he set out to conquer he conquered but he held on to none of it <laughs> so uh yeah no um and i do like epirus i think it's a cool faction Bosporans are in A because I love them. I find them incredibly interesting historically. And you get horse archers, which, yeah, uh, nothing more needs to be said. They're in A. They they get horse archers. Ptolemy's in S because I personally am not that interested in playing them. I hate them as a sell you Chad lover, sell you Chad enjoyer. I must hate the Ptolemies with a passion. No, I don't actually hate them. I'm just joking. But... <laughs> yeah, they just don't interest me as much um, as the other ones on the top of the S. But I can't put them anywhere lower because I just know they are so strong. They are one of the strongest factions, if not still the strongest faction in the game. Antigonids, because it's the Antigonids, like nothing more really needs to be said. It's the Antigonids, they're cool as fuck. And um, yeah, you can become a hegemon in Greece pretty easily. Bactria, just because historically so interesting... They remained there for such a long time that it would it would shock you. They had a war with China, kind of, right? Like a, a mini war with China. So, like, how cool is that? Like, historically, that is incredibly cool. Um, and the fact that they remained there, I think it was, you know, up until the, the 500s to 800s, maybe AD, that there was some Hold sort of... Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, you're getting a little too out there now. Is the that... Back the Bactrian kingdom didn't last there long, but there was descendants of the Bactrians. Oh, okay. Did. Sorry, I was thinking culturally. Yeah. It wasn't culturally. the and then the war you're starting the war of the heavenly horses. Um, it was this state called uh, Dayuan. Day Dayuan. Uh, I do not believe those are the Bactrians. They are more Sogdians, but mm. they. I don't know. Well, hold on. Wiki says they were ruling Bactria at the time. Right. Okay. Cool. But were they the actual Bactrians? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I just mean, um, like culturally, they existed there for like they had such a mark on the uh, area because this yeah. obviously just sent loads of people there to <laughs> and loads of gold. Um, and then finally. The sell you chads, my favorite faction out of them all. Prefer like even more favorite than Rome or Carthage or the Belge, um, you know, or Paphlagonia. If I was doing a, a list of all the factions, the Seleucids would be on top. Best roster, really interesting start position. Very strong, obviously, but quite a lot of wars to fight, loads of battles love the Seleucids, so gotta be on top but um we'll see a contrast now shall we <laughs> <laughs> um all right right and here we go a yeah. howls uh one down below as you can see quite a contrast <laughs> there you go i mean it's not a surprise at this point with how i rank my factions um so we'll start with the s tier lysiads i mean they're just interesting. Again, any obscurities, interesting factions that nobody really knows about. That's kind of my jam. I like it. Um, and the Hellenistic Rebels, for me, it's more like holding out hope for future campaigns once we can kind of like delve deeper into it. Um, spawning characters and all that stuff is not easy right now. So... Um, if we are able to figure out how to do that without crashing the game and causing a bunch of bugs and issues, we could probably use that faction for some interesting scenarios. Um, there's three scenarios, really. There's Andragoras that I already talked about. There's mm. Alexander of Corinth, which, again, debatable in, in academia, but still a cool scenario where basically uh, he's a character and his father is the governor of Corinth, but once he dies, kind of like he took over and he kind of rivaled um the Antigonids and it said that he beat the Achaeans and the Aetolians and he had allied himself with the Ptolemies and then he was poisoned. So, you know, 
another what if and then the other what if would be a break away from the Ptolemaic kingdom um involving my lettuce uh, the guy that's governing my Letos right now is um, a, like he breaks away and Ptolemy the Sun, which is in Lycia, breaks away with him. And he's a, I guess he's like kind of a descendant of the Lysimachid dynasty. And it's kind of like you could use the Hellenistic rebels to refound the Lysimachid dynasty. So um, it was a huge thing I had planned. I really wanted it, but it just switching characters and swapping characters and spawning characters was very buggy caused a lot of issues and um, just not worth adding so right now they are what they are but i have them up here for the future what if scenarios if we can implement them yeah yeah uh bactria is one of my favorite factions especially like on vanilla style mods um like extended greek mod used the romano british faction symbol and i always kind of liked that and just they were also one of my favorite factions to play as on Rome Total Reels and Platinum Edition. So they're just really cool. Um, the Bosporans, another one of my favorite factions. I believe they should have been in vanilla. Um, I usually add them in my vanilla mods. So again, one of my favorites. Epirus is also one of my favorites. Um, again, just nostalgic reasons. And they had such an interesting history, especially with Pyrrhus. Kyrene and Pergamon are like, again, these are like my meh tier, like, don't yeah. care, like, whatever. Uh, Antigonids, out of the three big boys, they're my favorite because I, I read a book on Antigonus Gonatus, and it was just really cool the way they start. I kind of feel like they are an underdog at the start um, because they have no military of their own, and they're just kind of like surviving with mercenaries. So I thought that was really cool. And then the Seleucids and Ptolemies, it's just like, there's enough people that are fans of them. I don't need to be one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm prime example. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. When I saw the Seleucids and Ptolemies on the bottom, I was like, oh no, no. <laughs> hey, but I, well, to be I, fair, to you, to be fair to you, I put the Seleucids before I put the Ptolemies. Yeah, but I know I know why uh, I know why they're there. So uh, yeah, no, and I do like the fact that you have Bactria, Bosporans, and Epirus up there as well. Very good, very yeah, good. Yeah, and I I do like Seleucid history way more than I do Ptolemaic history. So Seleucid history and the way they um, actually working on the Seleucids this dev cycle is um, something I'm really excited for. So mm. you know they're gonna be. They're going to be a little bit different, hopefully, in the next release. I'm not sure what exactly it'll be, but we have some ideas. We just need to test them. So, Yeah. Well, uh, they would have had it all if not for uh, Karaunos anyway. So, uh, Karaunos. Oh, what a bastard. <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it, guys. So, um, thank you uh, very much for watching. And once again, thank you, Ahal, for joining me to do these uh, glorious faction rankings. No, oh, yeah, no problem, man. It was such a great time being here, and I'm really excited to do the finale with you. Oh, yeah, that's going to take, like, 70 hours. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, keep a lookout for that announcement, guys, when we're going to do the Greeks on a live stream. So you can all shout abuse at us while we're doing it <laughs> and tell us that we're wrong um but yeah we're going to be doing all the greeks and there's a lot of greek factions so that's going to be really really fun so um do make sure that you uh, check that out and if you want to guys you can join the uh, membership program thank you to david to zero and pascal as the channel members at the moment make sure you do like and subscribe guys and i'll see you all again on the next video